Morning, everyone. Lovely to see so many of you here today. Thanks, Hannah. Um, so this is a little bit about me. Um, it was on the Creative Mornings. So my background initially was surface print design. I worked in the wallpaper and fabric off some for, um, soft furnishings industry for seven or eight years. And then I moved over to Dulux Trade and unfortunately I've been there 25 years um, as a, color, a commercial colour consultant. So colours sort of threaded through my veins my entire life, really from childhood. It's something that's been with me, lived with me and was sort of drawn out of me at university level that colour was my thing, uh, whichever design discipline I went into. Um, some of this presentation today, um, I think might be teaching you to suck eggs, some of you that are quite au fait with colour. Um, what I want to say at the beginning is that usually I'm um, presenting to a creative of the same type within a room, but this is so exciting because I've got so many different types of creative, whether that's somebody who writes, somebody designs, or somebody that creates pottery, somebody that creates jewellery, fashion. But colour is threaded through our lives. So what I'm going to try and do, is not got very long to do it, but I just want you to relate colour to your life, your business, your person. So let's get thinking about colour and moving around. Um, I don't want to kill you by PowerPoint. So my PowerPoint have very few words. Um, I do a lot of waffling, I go off piece, but do feel free to come and ask me lots of questions afterwards if you want me to try and relate it to what you do or need help with anything. So let's move on as quickly as we can. So that's just a brief little, this is my day job. This is my Dulux job. This is what I do. Um, I work um, specifying colour. I'm not an interior designer as such, although I do dip in and out of that. I specify flooring, I do specify furniture, but I specify colour. And I do that in a way that is fit for the built environment. So how we navigate space, so colour is used for wayfinding, we apply colour in certain situations for people um, with, say, dementia or a special educational need. So I do also a lot to colour and that, that's the day job. So I don't want to hang on that so you, you can see where background. So let's climb into a colour space. So everyone stand up. Okay. So I'm presuming that everybody today has walked into this room wearing some form of footwear. So sit down if you would have bought that footwear if it was Happy St. Patrick's Day green. If you, would, if you would have bought them and they were green. Okay. Sit down if you would have bought them if they were magenta pink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, you see, I do this with reps normally and they're all black and brown and they, they you know, they all sit down. Um, okay, so sit down if you'd have bought them if they were white. Okay. So the people standing, how do you feel about your footwear? Did you purchase your footwear for colour or comfort? Which came first? I didn't get to my colour. Oh, sorry. I'm not going to go through this. So colour, does colour come first in your selection process? Yes. Okay. So let's get, that's got you thinking, hasn't it? Okay. So you can all sit down again now. Thinking about where you've headed to today, what colour is the front of this building? Well, what would you, what would you, can, there is a peregrine falcon there as well. Yeah, yeah, it's red brick, red brick. But walking towards it, if you were to tell somebody, I'm going to go to the Museum of Making, you need to look for the... Black gates with the gold How do you describe where you're heading to? When you get to the end of the corridor, turn right at the what sign? The green sign, the blue sign, the red sign. So thinking about colour, it's threaded in all that we do, but it's a subconscious reaction quite often, but you'll know that you, you'll, you'll subconsciously wayfind by using colour. So it's, it's within you and you use colour without even interacting with it directly or consciously acting with it. So, yes, I've threaded it in <laughs> somewhere. 
Um, so corruption, Hannah gave me the most difficult word of the year. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So as I said, it's happy St. Patrick's Day today. So the corruption comes from the Latin, um, con meaning with together and, and to break. So we, we corrupt things by changing them, breaking them and doing things in the wrong way and doing things badly. Oh, so we're on. So St. Patrick, is he green or is he blue? Has St. Patrick been corrupted? Yeah. St. Patrick was never green. St. Patrick's Day is not green. St. Patrick's Day is green because over time, the colour of St. Patrick has been corrupted. In such a way, it has been a commercial corruption. So St. Patrick, um, the government of Ireland, very deep traditions of Ireland, still use traditional Patrick blue. What happened was, St. Patrick used to preach, not even with a shamrock, with a clover, a three-leaf clover, which was green. And the green symbol, symbolism of green came from that. And as it went over the ocean to the USA, they picked up on the green and started to wear green to the point now where they dye the river green on St. Patrick's Day. And it, it, it commercially, we even dye beer green as well. So over time and years, there's been a corruption. So has that corruption been for a benefit or a negative move with colour and that's for you to decide really so it can be positive for everybody that benefits from the green of St Patrick's Day but the authenticity of St Patrick's is very much blue so just just a fact for St Patrick yeah it would that quite you know meant to be blue so that was my little thread in of St Patrick okay so Back to school now. So some really basic stuff. And like I said, some of this will be teaching you to suck eggs. So, okay. So when we see colour, um, what I didn't want to do today was go back to school, go all through how the colour wheel and theory and all of that. So just going to touch on things and I'll talk around it. So just a re refresh on how we see colour. So this is quite important depending on how you apply that to your business or your person or your design. So when light hits a surface, um, it absorbs all the colours except the colour that that surface is and that will be reflected out and that is how the eye sees colour. So here you can see when it hits white, it reflects. So white has the highest LRV, which is light reflectance value. So that's how much light is bounced off a surface or a wall surface, a floor, a door, a handle, a page in a book, a, a screen. So you, you've got a light reflectance value highest in the white. In black has very little or none light reflectance value so all, everything is absorbed and we see black and then all the colors in between hit the surface and you see the color that there is it's quite simple so this is the eye this is the back of the eye magnified and our brain sending that message so we see we're receiving color and at the back of the eye we've got rods and cones and they the color hits those and that's how we, we see colour. Now, on an evening, <coughs> the rods will act differently and we switch from cones to rods and they see the wavelengths quite differently. So you've got shorter wavelengths and longer wavelengths and the shorter wavelengths um, we see better in the evening. So when you see, shall I example this for you? So, um, Often bluebells or grape hyacinths in your garden, you'll see at dusk and you can't see anything else, but you see these little blue glinting. We also have emergency vehicle lights, don't we, that are blue because you can see them in the dark, you can see them at dusk and that's how your eye reacts. And it goes past that passage of time and all your other colours just disappear because we don't. our eye then doesn't have that ability to see colour in the dark. 
but in the daytime what these do is absorb the colour and then bounce those, those colours back so we actually see colour. Could you knock the lights for me now please? They're behind oh. Johanna. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, could you all focus on the white dot in the middle of the screen? <laughs> so give it a few seconds. You need to focus on the white dot in the center of this. Keep looking. Don't look at me, look at the screen. Keep looking. Do you see colour? Yeah. What we've done there, you've overkilled and switched off the cones at the back of your eye. So you've seen too much of the red. So it, sh it shut them off, so it's only showing you the blue and the green. And you probably get it back now, and we've got a grey picture. So too much colour can affect your eye and how you see it. And also, this is something to consider. Things like special educational need, or if you're creating a product and you think, you know, uh, uh, for instance, a dinner mat, a dinner plate, you sat looking at something that's a, a constant colour and it's very hard on the eye. And this is when colours tire and colours can affect people and make people feel uncomfortable. So it's, it's thinking about too much and proportions of colour and how we would apply that to a design or a space or an image. So moving on. I'm conscious of time, I want to get you moving around a little bit. So the science of colour, I'm not going to go into this into detail today, but colour is measured in three different ways, three different aspects. We've got the hue. So the hue, so how I like to describe this, hue is the family that that colour belongs to. It belongs to a blue blue, a blue green, a yellow yellow, yellow orange, but the hue is that family. It is just the colour family that that belongs to. And then we have the LRV, which I explained a little bit, which is how light or dark a colour is, so how much it reflects the light. So that's usually measured in 100 steps. And then the chroma, which is the one that people understand the least. And that, how I describe that is, that's how intense a colour is. So it's how much a colour is pigmented. So it's not how light or dark a colour is, it's how, how much colour it actually has in it on the grey scale. So if you were mixing grey paint or you'd got paint the colour of these divider doors, it's how much pigment of colour you would put into that develops the chroma. So the chroma, the higher the chroma doesn't necessarily mean the higher the LRV, but it could do and the majority of time it does, but not always. So colour theory, again, keeping it really basic today because we don't have the time to expand on this as much. But here, colour theory, so these are your colour families going around the wheel and we have primary, secondary, tertiary. This is taking you back to school. But this is the colour wheel and this is the spectrum. And all colour comes from this wheel, but this wheel can go in and it can go out and we can have tints, harmonies, we can have undertones of colour, but they're all for a different workshop. So, but undertones are quite a complex area to cover. So this is the one that I think you've probably all arrived here today thinking that this is what this is about, this talk's going to be about. So colour psychology, and what do we think about it? So marketeers, I don't know if you've got any marketeers in the room, I sit within a marketing company, this is where they base their colour knowledge generally. I'm not <laughs> marketeers. So there's an element of colour psychology it, and it links directly to the science. So it's about the wavelengths. So how short or long we see colours. And so if I say Ferrari, what colour car do you think of? Why do you think of red? Why do they paint Ferraris red? 
Because the rep. It's, 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 not, it's how we remember, it's what we associate with speed. We associate it with speed, but why do we associate it with speed? Because if a red car passes you, it looks like it's travelling faster than a blue car because of the colour it is. So that's the psychology behind that particular colour. So it's the same parcel force, it's, they're red. So historically, psychology was taken from the science and this is where it's developed from. But as you've just spoken about, we have lots of other elements as well. So we have colour association, we have relationships with colour. We have emotions with colour. It's not all around the psychology. We also have different um, depths of colour. So one colour, so we say purple, that could be rich, deep and spiritual and dark, or it could be very light and soft and harmonious. One colour doesn't fit all and psychology doesn't fit all. We have to blend that with association, relationship, historic, culture so all of those things come into the, the element of color psychology the basic color psychology which we google and look up is based around the science but then we have to think beyond the science to be able to have clever color combinations that work for you your life your business your being so the language of color so <laughs> This is quite a complicated area. So many of you use, will use different languages of colour. So you've got CMKY, you've got RGB, you've got Pantone, you've got NCS, you've got British Standard, and then you've got lots in between. So every individual paint manufacturer has their own notation system. But what those notations do, all of them will tell you the different elements the hue, the chroma, the LRV will be in that notation. So one learning today, if you use one of these formulas in anything you do, so if you're brand planning with marketeers, if you're decorating your office space, if you're selecting fabrics, if you're selecting paint samples, take the time to investigate that colour notation because what that colour notation will tell you is what is in that colour and how that colour is built up and how you can apply that to the project that you're working on. So it's really important to try to start understand language and that's, again, something else that I could, we can help with, that there's lots of languages and they don't all connect and interact. So in my life, and I have people saying, oh, well, I want my walls are Pantone, such as, well, we can't mix Pantone into an emulsion paint. Pantone, and they're two different things. They're used for different purposes, different finishes. So we, we have RAL in the mix. RAL is pre-finished. So this grey, I know, will be a RAL colour because pre-finished surfaces are RAL, majority or BS. So, you know, there are different industries do different notation systems. So that's another area to be quite interested in. So colour is not static. And when I say that, it's every time you look and then look away and look back, you are seeing colour differently, slightly different. The sun's moving outside. We've got natural light in this room, so everything changes differently. We all have receptors in our eyes that are very slightly different, so you will see differently to the person sat next to you. Um, people with colourblind problems see completely differently to how um, general public do and women see slightly different to, to men and younger people see differently to the older generation. So as our eye gets older, it yellows. So if I was designing for sheltered housing for over 50s, um, then we would stay, go to fresher shades because our eye yellows all the colours as we age. So we would make sure that those colours are slightly fresher and on the cooler side rather than the warmer side because the eye will warm those colours naturally. So there's elements that we have to think about as well. So your audience that you're designing for and how they will see that colour. So it's also not static in the respect that it's not static through time. So a few in there that would have sat on a McDonald's seat in the 1980s, a few of us, me too. So... If you think back to then, 
So you sat on a red McDonald's seat because the ethos of that company was fast food was new, it was exciting, it was a bum on a seat and off again. It was painted red for speed. So you sat there, you ate your burger and off you went. You go into McDonald's now, you've got an aubergine, you've got a brown, you've got green, you've got nature, you've got sustainability. They want you to sit and buy a second coffee, you've got a plug-in for your phone. So their colour hasn't stayed static, their branding. And this is as a business and small businesses, what you need to do is move with your times. Your brand colour may change as you develop. You might not always be that lovely green that you liked in 1997 and moved it on. It might be it changes to a different green or you might rebrand. And we see this with some of the really big corporate organisations. But as a small business, you don't need to stay static either. Your colour needs to move. And that can move, I'm not saying particularly with trend, but more about you as you grow as a business, as a person, as an individual. You need to move and, and move colour with you. It's part of you and everybody around you, but more importantly, it's, it's part of your customer. So you need to move with that. It's not a static thing. So in your envelope, okay, I'm going to get you to move just for a second um, before we go. So has anyone for the coffee task, just out of interest, I just think, has anybody got anything other than sight for number one? Okay. Would any of you like to share what you've got as, I know what yours will be. <laughs> okay. Yeah, share, please. Hearing. I've been assigned language and services for 30 years, and I recognise the disadvantages there are with not being able to hear. Okay, so you recognise that as because number one. Language people. Yeah, okay. But you as an individual, would that come first as the top of your... Yeah, okay. Does anybody else want to share? Go on. Uh, mine's touch. Yeah. Because I make things and I know I can make them smile. Yeah. So, okay. still be a and yours got be touch. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But the rest of the room, I presume you all had sight as your number one. So do you find it quite interesting how you rank your senses? What's more important? I didn't know if we had any foodies in here that might put taste at the top of theirs, which is. But to be able to prepare and do it, sight, we need for everything. But also. And a fa an interesting fact as well, even um, uh, registered people that are registered blind generally have got 20%, 30% still of sight, and what they see is contrast. So sight's important, but people say, oh, well, if, if you're blind, it's still really important. So contrasting colour is hugely important when you're navigating space. So one of the things, as my role... Um, I'm going off piece a little bit now, but interesting things. So, and, and not thought about, and often not thought about in buildings such as this. Uh, but although I do think this this is really well designed, um, so the flooring and the door should not be the same colour. So somebody who is partially sighted, and the flooring, a carpeted floor or a wooden floor, and if these doors weren't grey and they were full timber, to somebody partially sighted, it's a continuation of that floor. They walk straight into that door, especially these ones that are glazed. So it's just having that forethought. But what we're not doing, you don't need to start designing products for disability or for special needs. What you need to do is design products for all users so that it meets Equality Act guidelines so that you're actually designing for everybody. So especially in interior design, if you're designing for a space. So an example of this that isn't colour related is when you, an architect builds, designs a building, they design level entry. They don't design a ramp or a lift. They design a building level entry. So when you're applying colour to product or paper or space, Design it for all users in mind, for everybody that's going to use whatever it is that you're designing and using colour for. So now we're going to move on to your sensors. 
So our senses and the environment. So inside your envelope, you have a word. Okay, and you've got some a nice little blob of blue tack. So you all get up, move around, discuss with each other. But I want it to be quite quick because I'm conscious of time. But would you like to go? There's, there's strips of colour all around the room. Do you want to go and associate your word with a colour? It can you can put it high or low, so it's a deep colour, a light colour. They're pretty basic colours, but can you stick your word next to? It? Okay. Did everyone find that quite easy to do? Did you know instantly where to put it? Yeah, this lady didn't. No, no. But we have that relationship, don't we? And most of you were nodding. You all had a random word. You were nodding. You, you knew where to go with it. So you've got a subconscious reaction with colour that you don't actually know about, but you know where... You know, and I'm not going to go around them so we don't have time, but afterwards, if you want to have a look where people have put words and what they relate, and you probably wouldn't have put that word in the same place either. So your relationship is unique to you. Colour is unique to you. So thinking about our senses and our environment, I want to move us on quite quickly. You've got three blank pieces of paper, haven't you now? So let's have a talk about... So I want you to take yourselves out of your personal creative head. It's really difficult, really difficult. I find it really difficult. Take yourself out of your own head creatively. Put yourself in your customer's head. So put yourself somewhere so in, in regard to colour. So take your own personality, your own colour personality, out of your thought process and start to think about your business and how you want to think about colour for your business, whether that's a brand, a logo, a product, a person, the space you want to use to deliver a story. So think about that. You've got three pieces of paper. And what I want you to do is I want you to write down, I've, I've, take that all back, I've gone to, <laughs> made a mistake here. So I want you to think about your, take yourself out of person, yeah, no, think about what I've said, your customer, for your business, and I want you to write down three emotions on your three pieces of paper that you've got in your little envelope. I can see the paper around you for honest, Yeah. So three emotions that relate to your business, your customer, somebody who will use your service or the space that you want to apply colour to, but three emotions that describe what you are, what you do, what you're about. But take your own personal taste and creativity out of that. You're thinking about who you're selling to. Who, who creatively, who is going to use your service, your business, your product? And it's really difficult to do because if you're a creative, you know what you like, you know what you best, and it threads through your business as a vein. But what I have to do as a designer is if you saw inside my own home, it is not representative of anything that I do in my work life regarding to colour. I've got a totally different style and it's take... Hannah knows she's been in my house. <laughs> it's messy. Um, but separate the two. And in creative business, this is what I find working in a corporate organisation that creative people find really difficult to do is to take yourself out of your business and really focus on the, the, per, the person that is going to explore your business, purchase from you, use your services. So write down three emotions that represent that. And I'll just give you a couple of minutes to do that. What I'd like you to do now is go across to these two tables and select three colours for the person you're, you're, you've just swapped with that meet those emotions. So you're going to 
attach a colour to those three emotions. You're going to build a mini colour palette for the person. So go! <laughs> so Sarah just shared hers. Could you just stand up and show? So she, they've swapped back now, but her emotions... But this is really quite interesting. So. They're the colours that Claire chose for the emotions that I... And could you share what the emotions were? Oh, I'm a coach. So people come to me if they are anxious, confused and stressed. They're the colours. And Claire, not knowing that I'd up to my branding, that's my business. It's really complimentary. That's it. Yeah. Is anybody quite shocked by what the colours that the other person selected? Is it not what they expected? <laughs> you know, what have you got? What are your emotions? So I've got trusting, caring and understanding. And I did struggle with the kind of idea of putting emotions into words for my customer. But um, Jonathan's given me this nice pink for, I think, I think that's just, oh, that's caring sorry uh -huh. and then it gave me this uh kind of interesting green that i would never have chosen for myself but that was the i think that was understanding and then a brighter green with the two greens together for the what's the other understanding i don't know which way around they are but so it's kind of like pink green pink <laughs> but like <laughs> slightly different shades and i would never have picked that out as a branding so it's interesting, but it, it looks quite... Yeah, nice. and yet we've done, we've done this process really, really quickly, and I'm not saying that those colours are going would be your branding, but what it is doing is getting the thought process for you to think about the emotions that your customers will have when they're coming to purchase something from you. So with Sarah, she's a service, it's about talking, so her branding is really, really important, but... Um, with Gary, it's product. So somebody's coming along to buy a product, so we need to think about the product, the packaging, and the branding, the whole thing, where they've got, we've got traditional branding, so we need to do something else with colour in the packaging. So thinking about your audience. So emotional design, I'm going to touch on this very quickly. I'll read out my notes on this, so it's quite, it's quite quick. So what I would say is emotions are at the heart of how we interact with the world around us. <laughs> And the products and services um, are no exception. It's crucial to create experience that foster emotional connections. So if you connect with your customer via colour, you, you're connecting with an emotion and they will have a relationship with that colour that you might not have. So the colour has meaning to them, might not have to you. But it, it is also that, that connection. Um, people um, form connections and associations with things that they use, experience, come across in everyday life. They take this with them to the next chapter where they may or not influence their decision. Equally, you can have negative emotions and colours associated with negative emotion that will push your customers away and we're like, I don't want to use that service because, and they don't know why because it, it's a subconscious reaction. So you need to build colour into everything and, and it could be it touches lots of bits of your business differently but it pulls it together so it's thinking about how people are driven by their emotion so thinking about how we take colour with us so um, think about what I mean, this is a really quick one because done at the beginning but um, your favourite colour stand up if it's yellow Stand up if it's green. <laughs> Stand up if it's blue. Okay. Stand up if it's purple. Pink. Okay. So did anybody notice within what I've just said Anything unusual when I, I selected those? So the blue is the most popular colour worldwide. Colour psychology tells us that it's a trustworthy colour. But also, who else stood up when it was blue? Because more men. And that's taught behaviour with colour from childhood. Hopefully we're getting out of that now. 
but it's taught. So that's travelled with you. And it could have maybe been a different colour story if you were born today. So you were influenced right through your life with colour. I mean, I'm influenced. I had a hatred of um, like an insipid orange that was everywhere in my at grandparents' home and I would never have it in anything I ever did. And when I get asked to do that type of colour scheme, I'm like, oh, I really struggle with it. Um, so you have negative reactions to colour as well as positive reactions, but your emotions are attached to you all the time and they travel with you, but you attach those emotions subconsciously and you also attach them culturally as well. So emotional... So, did anybody have the word pure as their word or wedding? Or, and where did you put it? Near the back. Right, right, yeah. So association, usually when we have pure um, weddings, we associate white and purity and um, cleanliness and everything white. But that's associated with the Western world. So if we look towards the east, then it's associated with different things. Reds for weddings, whites for death. We have red for luck. It's, it, it's an association. And we have cultural associations within the UK as well. So you have Suffolk pink. We get away with painting colours at the coast, different twin land. That, again, is affected by different elements, light elements, um, cultural elements. <coughs> Landscape has an effect. Um, and we take we take all that on board and we absorb all of that and then it, it breaks out as emotion. So an example of emotional design. So this is um, a project oh, like three, three years ago now. If any of you've got children, you enter uh, Derby Children's Outpatients. This is what they selected um, to have there and it's just coming to fruition at the moment. But here, we talked about emotions with staff. We talked about how they wanted to change the space and how they wanted this area to look. Um, they, one of the words that they had for this was cu um, curious. They wanted it to be curious for the children. So we've done flooring that the travels through. Um, the children have a subconscious reaction to that and it will actually take them through to reception. Different departments don't actually know how they got there, but they're, they're busy doing that via colour. Um, they wanted it to be calm. I don't know if anybody had been there now. It, it's a multitude of different things. Bring it right down, calm, soft. Um, and also for it to be super important that somebody or a child, a parent or a child with a special educational need can navigate that area without making them feel anxious, upset, on edge. So we, we pulled it all right back down. So it's quite different. So that we work this design with emotion, so there's no yellows in there, there's no oranges. We, we, we calmed it right down to soften it and to use colours that we know are right for those emotions. Um, and then moving on and how we put palettes together. Um, so this thinking about this, and this is something you can go away today with, think really long and hard about the emotions of your business and then look at colours and start again and do what you did in five minutes but do it slowly and thoughtfully. And here, a three emotional. These are for a project that was for um, a hotel chain. Um, and we work, we work with words. So reflective, contented and supportive. And we got country, coastal colours, uh, strong, productive and confident for urban contemporary hotels that were for business, for doing business in, for quick in, quick out, relaxed, secure and friendly, country houses, you know, uh, um, Scottish Highlands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these these are just quick ways of how we can relate emotion and feeling to colour. And once you attach the two, you can quite confidently make palettes. But it's it's working out how you do that. So, are you now closer to your customers' emotions? Do you feel you're a bit closer after this past half now? Do the colours? Um, start the story so look at the colors swap that you've swapped back do they actually start your story do they tell that emotion do you agree with them but are they going to make you stop think move on and look at color differently in the way you work 
And can you relate to the emotional colour? Can you actually do it? Do you feel that you can now go away and relate emotion to colour and how that colour makes you feel and how you connect the colours? So how does it make us feel in here? We've got two shades of grey and then we've got the warmth of the red and the warmth of the timber floor. How does it make... Think about the space and how it makes you actually feel. And I'd just like to say thank you for listening to me. You've been a great audience. Um, if you do need my help, that's who I am at the bottom there. Um, using insights, colour theory, with thoughtfulness, function and form creates engaging storytelling with meaningful colour. So colour can be part of your story, whether it's a service, whether you're an artist, whether you're a fashion designer, interior designer, whatever you are, colour is it within your life and threaded through it and we are the most colourful creative room today I think so give yourselves a round of applause and thank you